Our Barefoot Church. It is good to be with you. Merry Christmas. Those of you here at Main Street in Whiteville and around the world, uh, join us at our internet campus. We are excited to continue and actually close up a series as we lead into a New Year's Eve a series that we've entitled No Thanks, saying no to the things that the world might throw at us and yes to the life of significance that God calls us to live in and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to be looking at a passage that would be very familiar to you uh, if you're familiar with the Christmas story and all that surrounds it. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 26 through 38. The setting, of course, is when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and announced that she would be giving birth to the Son of God. Uh, before we dive into reading it and unpacking it together, though, I, I want us to be reminded that it is important when we get a message or we get a letter that we understand the language of the letter so that we understand the meat of the message. Uh, I, I was reminded just the other day of how true this is. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you remember life before cell phones? It, okay, all right, all right. I, I, I was writing a paper for this research project I was doing, and it was looking at the gener different generations, and it said, well, there, this generation, some still living that know what life was like before television. And it said, then there's the generation that knows what life was like before cell phones, and I had to admit that I'm a part of that generation. We had a TV when I grew up. It was black and white and it had the rabbit ears and you had to stand a certain way with tinfoil wrapped around it to get anything, but we had a TV. But then I started thinking about cell phones and text messaging. You know, you have to be really careful what you text and make sure that the person you're texting to knows you and the language that you use, if you will, or they might receive that text wrong. Look, I've been married a little over 20 years and I just left a message the other morning and my wife didn't have a clue what it was. And I thought, really, she missed it? Let's just see if you can get this. Hopefully you've heard me enough to understand what this is. Now my, wife, my two daughters' names are Breland and Bailey. And Bree, we call the oldest one, and Bay, we call the younger. Bay short for Bailey, Bree short for Breland. Bree and I were leaving early that morning to run some errands, pick up a few things and come back. So we left this note on the milk carton in the refrigerator. And it says, if you'll help me, we love mom and they, all right, say that last part again. Okay, most of you got it. Pastor Clay said Kassoon. <laughs> nah, he, he said it because he, he heard uh, earlier, actually he said cousin, I think, or something. That's how they say it down in South Georgia, cousin or Kassoon or something. That's my Kassoon down the road lives around yonder. <laughs> My, uh, my wife, though, a couple days after we left this message, we're seated around the table, sharing a meal together, and Bailey, our youngest, says, Dad, I forgot to tell you, thanks for the message you left us the other morning. It had been a couple days, and I said, message? She said, the one on the milk carton. I said, oh, you got it, awesome. I was wondering, I didn't hear anything, and Bonnie looked at me and said, I didn't say anything because I wasn't sure what it meant. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I got the we love you part, but the kassoon I couldn't make out. I said, cause soon, that was see you soon. She said, I don't understand all that text language. I have been informed by my girls that see you, you know, that's a breeze in text language. Took me a while to figure out that a breeze means abbreviation, but that's a breeze in text language. So my wife now better understood the message because she understood the language of the letter. Well, as we look at this message that came not from around 
the corner or even from abroad, but came from above, uh, from heaven to earth by way of one of the two angels that, were, that we know their name of in Scripture. Legions of angels the Bible speaks of. Great book by Billy Graham called Angels. If you're interested in learning about these heavenly messengers and earthly friends that God has used throughout history at certain times to deliver certain messages. And only two of them are given names that we know of. And one is Gabriel who brought this message to Mary uh, in Luke 126 through 38. And the message contained a certain language that we need to understand so that we can make sense out of what was being said and better understand why Mary responded the way she did in her cultural setting. We might lose the impact of the message if we do not understand the language. Uh, what I'm referring to is Bible prophecy. Uh, this short message, just a handful of verses in chapter 1, contains powerfully packed prophecies that Mary would understand, which enabled her to receive the message with much more eagerness than she would have if she didn't know the prophecy. Now, if you're unfamiliar with a prophecy, this would uh, hopefully explain it in a way that you'd be able to receive it. A prophecy was a word that was given from God to a human like you and me that was called to the office of prophet to speak a word from God to his people before it would ever happen. And then years later, sometimes in the case of hundreds, even a thousand years later, the word would become a reality. So the prophet would receive a word from God, would share it, it would be written down, actually it would be shared verbally and verbally, and then it would be written down, and then hundreds, sometimes a thousand years later, it would come true, reiterating that what God said he would do. Well, in these few short verses, the language of the letter, so that we'll understand the meat of the message, not just for Mary, but for our sake, it's packed with Bible prophecies. Matter of fact, in this brief passage, we're going to see six Bible prophecies concerning the coming of Messiah, which Jesus fulfilled in his birth that we celebrate as Christmas. By the way, do you know that Christmas is not really a season to be celebrated? Christmas is actually the reason that we have to celebrate. Even though we refer to it as a season and we celebrate, shoot, we start back about Thanksgiving and celebrate Christmas in our home as a season, if you will. But it's really not just a season. It was actually meant to be the reason that you and I have to celebrate if we know faith in Christ. But this power-packed message is filled with six of the Bible prophecies that help us better understand the reason Christ came to earth that we refer to as Christmas. Now, to give you an idea of how important Bible prophecies are, there are over 300 of them that refer to Jesus' first coming, refer to him coming as this little babe in a manger and growing up and then ascending, in, dying on the cross, and then ascending into heaven. And out of those 300 plus prophecies, there was a mathematician some time ago who did a calculation to see what the probability would be that one individual could fulfill these prophecies. In his best efforts to calculate the probability that one individual would be able to fulfill these, he came up with that just for one person to fulfill eight of these messianic prophecies, prophecies concerning the coming of Messiah, Messiah means Savior, the one that would save his people, which is who Jesus came as Messiah, the one that would save people from their sins, Eight of those, the probability of one person fulfilling it would be one and one octillion. And if you're like me and you don't speak in octillion, octillion would be 10 times 20, 10, or excuse me, one times 10 to the 27th power. That's a lot of zeros. 
It's hard for me to wrap my mind around. I have to see things for it to make sense. And seeing all those numbers just blows my mind. So here's the probability. It, it, maybe this will help you. It helped me. It would be like taking Pastor Clay, putting him in a helicopter with a pilot, and allowing the pilot to fly him over the state of Texas a number of times, allowing him to look down. By the way, anybody ever driven across Texas? Wow, a lot of people have driven across Texas. My goodness, every service, hands everywhere. That is a long state to drive across. A few years ago, my family and I, we went from Myrtle Beach to San Diego. Coast to coast, five day trip, 10 to 12 hours driving a day. And I think three and a half days were across the state of Texas. I didn't think it would ever end. It's the largest landmass in the continental US. Analogously speaking, one times 10 to the 27th power would be like taking Pastor Clay, putting him in a helicopter, allowing the pilot to drive him around and around and considering Texas to be flat, nothing on it, no homes, no trees, nothing, and the entire state tiled with the regular two by two tile like you might see on a kitchen floor or a nice floor somewhere, and it being all white so you can't really make out the two by two, and on the bottom of one tile, a little dot of red paint. On the bottom, not the top, but on the bottom allowing the pilot to circle Pastor Clay around and then radio down as we're walking around and saying, okay, stop, flip over that tile. And that actually being the tile with the red dot would be the probability of one person fulfilling eight of those prophecies. Jesus didn't fulfill eight. He fulfilled all 300 plus prophecies. The Bible says it. That settles it. So Mary believed it. And so do I. Within the context of this brief message, six of those 300 plus prophecies are contained. Therefore, the meat of the message that she would receive, as we look, we'll understand it began to really make sense and settle in her spirit. And she responded in a way that I hope you and I would respond as well. Here's how it reads, starting in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Very significant. In the very beginning of the passage, it actually gives us the first prophecy out of the sixth that we see in this message and helps us understand Christmas, the reason for it and who Christ is. It says that the Messiah would be virgin born. We read about this long ago in Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. It speaks to the fact that Messiah would be bo born of a virgin. This is something that we have to hang our hat on if we call ourselves Christians. It's what's called the incarnation of Christ. It's God leaving heaven and coming to earth and being born as a man, yet without sin. How is it possible? Because he was born to a virgin. See, if Jesus were born naturally as you and I were, as in Mary would have been impregnated by a human, sin would have been passed. For sin is passed through the Father. For Adam sinned, and as the father of the human race, sin was passed through Adam to your father, to my father, to you, and to me, and so on. But the Messiah was prophesied in Isaiah over 700 years before he would come that he would not be born of man. Instead, he would be conceived in the womb of a virgin. This is something that we hang our hat on, the incarnation of Christ, which really we celebrate at Christmas, and the resurrection of Christ that we celebrate at Easter. Two things that separate, primarily, that separate our faith from any other faith on the planet. Something that we must grasp and understand so that we can celebrate Christ for who he is. There was a Sunday school teacher who understood this and knew that children can receive the word just as adults can. Actually, it says as adults, we must become like a child 
in order to believe. And she was doing her best to instruct these young ones on the virgin birth. And she was kind of telling this story. And she was saying, boys and girls, if you'll remember, the angel came to Mary and she said, and what was the angel's name? And, you know, a couple of them got it right and said, Gabriel. And she said, yes. And the angel spoke to the virgin Mary. And a little girl's hand went up and she said, what was that virgin's name again? And the teacher said, her name was Mary. And the little girl's brother eventually, you know, immediately raised his hand and she said, yeah, and what would you like, Dad? She said, well, I thought my grandma said he was the King James Virgin. <laughs> when I heard that, of course, I laughed as well. If you didn't quite get that, ask your neighbor later if you saw him laughing. Uh, actually, you know, King James was the version of a scripture as I'm reading out of the NASB, the New American Standard Bible Version. Uh, the Virgin Mary, though, is an important, important prophecy in this announcement to Mary, it would help her begin to understand because she knew that Messiah would come to earth by way of a virgin. In verse 28, it says, And coming in, he, that's the angel, said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, for you have found favor with God. Some versions actually read it this way. Do not fear, Mary, or fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Real quickly. Please understand, Mary's struggle at this point had nothing to do with the virgin birth. It was prophecy. She understood that Messiah would come to earth by way of a virgin. What she struggled with was that last part that we just looked at. Notice what it said. It said, the angel said to her, fear not, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. This was a struggle for Mary. If you remember in the first verse, it said that she was from Galilee. And it even singled out a little place in Galilee that she was from called Nazareth. I grew up about two hours inland from our main street campus in a rural area of South Carolina. And in my little town, there's a railroad set of railroad tracks that run straight through the town. On one side of the, the tracks would be what we would refer to where I grew up as the have-nots, if you will. On the other side of the tracks would have been what was referred to as the haves. And the haves were the one that people might look at in Mary's day because economically speaking, people's religious status, if you will, were tied to their economic situation. And she would have been from the have not side of the tracks, like where I grew up, rather than the haves side. So her struggle here was not that Messiah would be born to a virgin, but that she would be the one that was chosen. In her mind, she was thinking, why would God pick me? How am I a favored one? I'm just a little girl from Nazareth. There's nothing really special about my immediate family. Now, she knew her lineage. She understood her family tree and that she was from royal stock as we just read in verse 26, descended of David, but she was way, 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 way down the line just in that little old town called Nazareth. It was even thought of in Jesus' day as he would grow, uh, the term to be a Nazarene was considered a negative term within that culture and within that community. So she struggled with this. Perhaps you could struggle today with what others might think about you. If that's a struggle, please don't struggle with what God says about you. Because just as he said through Gabriel that Mary was highly favored, so God would say you were made with purpose as well. You know, the Bible actually says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. It says that he knit you together and formed you in your mother's womb, that you're not your father's failure or your mother's mistake. You're here by divine design, regardless 
of what side of the tracks you came from or what others may have said about you or what your crowd may have labeled you. In God's eyes, you are precious in his sight. If you believe that, give God a hand clap this day. Now, this was a struggle for Mary, not the virgin birth, the fact that she was the one chosen because at the moment, she did not recognize that she was favored. Verse 32, it starts to sink in. Or excuse me, verse 30, it starts to sink in. The angel said to her, fear not, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call him Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Please remember at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You do much better to confess it on this side than wait and do it on the other side. If that's a confession you've not made, it has been and will continue to be our prayer that you will not be able to sleep until you confess him as Lord. It is that important. You do not want to leave this world without him. And none of us know what a day holds, so we need to know the one that holds the day. And he's the only way that we can come to know the one that holds the day. His name is Jesus. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. If you notice in Isaiah 9 and 7, this is another prophecy. It was said over 700 years ago that Jesus would come and be given the throne of his father David. It's referring to King David, the lineage. Again, Mary grew up in a household that taught God's word, that knew God's word. This would have been second nature to her. She understood it, it resonated with her spirit. It wasn't a kasoon moment. It was a see you soon. She understood the letter of the, or excuse me, the language of the letter. The meat of the message was hitting home. She realized she was a descendant from David. Then as it continued, it said, and the Lord God will give him the throne to his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. This is another prophecy we see in this brief message that he will be king and he will reign from the house of Jacob. He will come from the house of Jacob. If you look in uh, Zechariah 9.9, when you get home and read, you'll learn that he was prophesying that he would be king. If you go back into Isaiah and look at chapter 9, verse 7, you'll see not only that he would descend from the house of David, but he would also come through the house of Jacob. Very specific prophecies so that there would be no mistake who Messiah would be and how he would come. This is something that Mary understood. And this is something that we need to understand. Uh, a few of the interns here at the church and one of my daughters and I went over to a local university from our Coastal Carolina University, not picking on a school, just putting a context to where we were. We were at Coastal Carolina University and we were walking around, they were helping me with uh, an assignment that I was doing. And in the assignment, there was a survey that volunteers we were asking to fill out. And in the survey, it reminded me of how the generation that's coming up today, how ignorant they are to the truth of Scripture. And it's not really their fault. It would be the fault of my generation. For many of us failed to teach those that are coming behind us these very things that Mary's family taught her. That's why she recognized the prophecy to be true. As a matter of fact, one question, and it blew my mind, that out of those that we interviewed, that no one gave the correct answer. The closest thing that was the correct answer was a young lady who had answered the question almost, it was in the ballpark, but the rest of her answers were so conflicting, it was evident that the answer she gave was one that she had just memorized and regurgitated in some class somewhere growing up along the way that had no real impact on her life. And that was, who was Jesus? One young man, American, answered, honestly, I don't know. That wasn't a challenge for Mary. She knew who Messiah would be. And as she was receiving this message, it was making more and more sense to her, which would allow us to understand why she responded 
in the way that she did. Look at verse 34. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? Please understand, Mary's question there not was to doubt the work that God would do. Mary's inquiring of the angel, how can this be, was basically her saying, tell me what's next so I'll know how to respond. She wasn't questioning God and saying, how can this be? I'm only a virgin. There's no way that I could possibly do it. God can't make this happen. No, she was saying, okay, I understand how babies are made. Well, at least as much as a person can understand. I mean, birth itself is a mystery. The fact that within the womb of a woman, from the seed of a man, a person could be produced, bones could be formed, a body could be shaped, a mind could be put together, and from the womb, one could grow up and become like you and me, a real live human being that could grow to full maturity. It's mind boggling just to consider what we would refer to as a natural birth, much less a supernatural birth. So her questioning the angel about the message of God was not that I don't believe this can happen. She had already resolved in her heart, according to the language of the letter, knowing that this message was from God and accepting now that she was favored of God. She'd already accepted that she was willing to take up her cross and follow the Lord as we're called to do. She was just saying, what's next for me? What, what do I need to do to take care of my part? I'm not sure what purpose God has for you in all areas of your life, but I do know as he has for me and so he had for Mary, his desire is that we would fear not as we begin to understand God's purpose and it unfolds in our life. Because that's actually what the angel continues to say. Listen to what takes place. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Now in this, we see that Jesus, the Messiah, would be begotten of God. That's another prophecy, Psalm 2-7, about a thousand years before the psalmist predicted that this would happen based on the word that God gave him to give to us even today. Not only would he be begotten of God, but he would be the son of God. Very specific language in this letter so that Mary would understand and so that she would not fear as she would carry out the message of the Lord. Now listen to this part in verse 36. Just for reassurance, the angel says, to Mary, and behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be, will be impossible with God. And for those of you that are familiar with Elizabeth and Mary and their relationship, this would have been her cousin, and she would now be six months pregnant with John the Baptist who was Jesus' cousin and also the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who would preach about the coming of the Messiah. If you'll remember in the Gospel of John, it's recorded that John the Baptist was baptizing, and then all of a sudden, Jesus would make his way into the crowd, and he would say, look, behold, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. See, these are prophecies that Mary would have understood because she knew God's word, more importantly, because she knew the God that gave the word. Listen at her response. In verse 38, behold, the bond slave of the Lord. Bond slave simply means servant. Behold, the servant of the Lord, referring to herself, May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. Mary received this message and it made sense. Why? Because she knew God's word and more importantly because she knew the God of the word. 
And even though she may not have fully grasped the brevity of it, she had all that she needed to move forward in obedience. The angel clarified to Mary that she was made for a purpose. And so I believe God would say to you and me today that we too are made for a purpose. Mary's purpose was to inaugurate what we know as Christmas. God would use her to birth into the world, not a season, but a reason for us to celebrate Christmas. Christ, God become man, and do what we could never do because we were born into sin, yet the Son of God was born of God, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit at the command of God the Father, Mary would give birth to the Son of God. He would live the life we couldn't, die the death we deserved, and then would be raised from the dead so that we could live out a purpose that we could not earn. Mary was made with a purpose, and so are you, and so am I. She was to inaugurate Christmas, and we are to announce it. We are to announce Christmas with our life and with our lips. We are to tell others in our circles of influence, the neighbors and the nations, as God would open doors for us to go or to send others, that Jesus Christ is Messiah. And that not only did he come at Christmas, but he has promised that he would come again and that we better be ready. And no, we don't know the day or the hour, but we do know his return is imminent. It could come before we leave this day. Therefore, we need to know him and to announce him that others might know. What a perfect opportunity we have over the next couple of days. P please don't miss this part. Over the next couple of days, like Easter, our friends and family that normally would not come to church are expecting us to invite them to come to our Christmas Eve services they're expect this is one of two times a year where those normally that would throw up the hand and say, nope, I don't want to hear anything about it. That they're open. Some have already gone out and bought brand new outfits because they're expecting you to invite them to the Christmas Eve service. My goodness, we got four opportunities, three, five, seven, and nine. Are you like my family? Come to all of them. Serve, love, hug, sweet. Mop, do whatever. Why? To help announce. To help announce. To help announce. Because that's our primary purpose in life. If we know and love God, that's to help announce that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't know whatever, what other specific purpose God might have for you today. Some it may he may be calling you just to be a better husband, a better father, a better child, a son or a daughter, a better neighbor. He may be calling you to up your giving. He may be calling you to give for the first time. I'm not sure all the purposes that God has for your life, but I do know that we share one, and that's that we would announce that Christ the Lord is King and that Christmas is not just a season. It is the reason that we gather and celebrate because God came to earth to make possible a purpose that we couldn't have without him. Therefore, our response should be like Mary's. And you notice, as the angel delivered the Lord in the beginning, he said, fear not. Oftentimes when God calls us to do something as humans, our initial response is fear, F-E-A-R. I would encourage you not to, as you would hear from the Lord, forget everything and run. Instead, I would encourage you to join me and let us do what Mary did and face everything and rise to what God has purposed for us to do. Do you know what Mary was really doing when she said, here I am, Lord, I'm your servant. May it be as you say. She was living up to her name. Do you know that her name actually mean, means favored one? <laughs> exalted one do you know if you know Christ personally if you've received the gift of Christmas Jesus that you too not only have a new name but have become a new person for if anyone is in Christ 2nd Corinthians 5 17 he or she is a new 
creation. Old things are gone. Behold, all things have become new. That means that you and I in Christ, we become a Christian. That new name means like Christ or little Christian or learner of or disciple or follower of. It means that we're to be like Christ. As God would purpose for you and me to announce, 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 let's live up to the name that God has given us as a Christian and face everything that he brings our way and rise to the occasion. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the vivid reminder in your word today, a message that came directly from you through an angel, Mary, the word now to us, that Christ, Christmas, is not really just a season. It is the reason that we have to celebrate God, may those that in faith I can call brothers and sisters join me, not just this time, but in our life with our lips and through our life, celebrating you in a way that we announce you to the world. May we especially over the next couple of days take full advantage and invite, 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 invite people to Christ and also to church that we might partner together as Pastor Clay presents Christ as King. The Lord also pray for those that may have stepped in. And even though possibly they've heard this before, it, it never really sunk in. It, it never resonated with their spirit in such a way that like Mary, they surrendered to you. God, would you touch those? And friend, if you're here with heads bowed and eyes closed and you've never really surrendered to Christ, You've never received the gift of Christmas. It's as simple as telling God, just as Mary did, I surrender to you. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the prophesied Son of God, God the Son, the one who came begotten of the Father, not born of man, but born of God, to a virgin who lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death, believe that he was raised from the dead so that you could have purpose beyond yourself, forgiveness of your sins, eternal life. Just tell God, just as Mary did. Here I am, Lord, I'm your servant. I receive the gift. May it be as your word says. And as you tell him in your own words, say, thank you, God. Help me live up to my new name as Christian. Lord, be worshiped and glorified in this season that we do call Christmas. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap if you would. Man, did you enjoy Pastor Sean today? Huh? You... Love how the Lord speaks through different ones of us in different ways and how he really challenges us and encourages us and mobilizes us forward to do the great things he has in store for us. And you know, as the pastor of this church, I want you to understand something. I believe that every single person at every single campus, wherever you are in the world, that God has a significant purpose for your life. I do not believe that you're an accident. I do not believe you live in this time and in this space uh, just kind of by happenstance. No, no, no. God has a purpose. And this is what I love about Pastor Sean's uh, message this weekend. I wrote down in my notes of this weekend, I took uh, several notes about uh, what God uh, said in his word. but. You know, really the point is that, you know what, we're all made for a purpose. But the way we discover that purpose is simply said, as he said here about Mary, is Mary believed. She believed what God said. She received what God said. And then she was able to achieve her purpose in life. And can I tell you something? It's the same thing in your life. If you'll believe what God says about you in the Scripture, and receive what God says, you'll begin to achieve the amazing, the fantastic, the incredible life that He has created for you to live and do those incredible things that He has created you to do. You know how I know? Because the Scripture says it. And I believe the Scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 states this about all of us who believe in Jesus Christ. It says, you are God's masterpiece. It says the way you become that masterpiece is you're created anew. 
in Christ Jesus. What you believe about this Jesus who was born that we celebrate this time of the year and his life and his death, burial, and resurrection. It says you are God's masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus so you can do. Everybody say can do. The amazing things that God has created for you to do. That's what the word says. And so that tells me something, that God has something he has created for each and every one of us uh, to do. And you're made with a purpose. Here at Barefoot Church, we want to help everybody discover that purpose and live out their God potential and do the great things that God has in store for them to do. And so I'm just thankful for this message today. I want to encourage you to begin to believe, receive, and achieve the great thing that God has for you. Again, it is no accident that you are the age you are, you're the gender you are, you're from the ethnicity that you are, you're of the economic class that you are. It is God's plan and purpose to do something significant and amazing through you. We serve a fantastic God. And He believes in you and has a plan for you.